it's a really a big panel here. It's not going to be a classically moderated discussion, um, I think. And uh, I mean, I don't think I'm going to read out all the intros I've done now in the last two days <laughs> for once more, but just to tell you, at least for those uh, who weren't here yesterday, maybe just um, with the names, maybe on the far right uh, uh, from me. <laughs> the About You translator, <laughs> Alberto Toscano. We have Nina Power, we have uh, Vanessa Thompson, we have Daniel Loic, we have Klaus Teveleit, we have Sayak Valencia, and Shofra is about to join us in a minute, I am told. So this is the very big and illustrious panel to close this uh, symposium on violence. And I'd just like to start out with the general questions and I would like to um, ask all of the participants of this panel to answer uh, this individually, actually. Before, I maybe have other questions, but before we open this up, I would say about in 30 minutes from now, it's just a very general question, because luckily, uh, all of the per participants, most of the per participants, actually have been here for the whole time of the symposium, so they really know what we have talked about here, and I'd like to start out this panel with the questions, what got you thinking? When did you think, like in a sort of a pause, oh yes, this is interesting. This is something I have not thought about before. This is really provocative. This is really outstanding. This got me to think. Alberto, I'll start out with you because you have to leave the earliest. <laughs> you mean within the conference? Oh yes. Oh. Not in your life. I don't, didn't want to get that personal, but... Uh, <laughs> We could talk about that later, but. Um, this is a very, uh, sorry, uh, I'm, a I'm a little uh, uh, thrown, uh, perhaps after the uh, conclusion of the um, of the last uh, uh, debate. So, um, in terms of uh, what got me thinking about the conference, yeah, maybe I was just thinking. Uh, I got, I was quite struck by the. Because partly she's she's not here, so maybe it's not so good to talk about her uh, uh, paper about Victoria's um, talk, and and in part uh, I was struck also thinking about the other um, papers about what it means to the choice of you know the choice of recounting um, uh, forms of uh, violence or stories about violence, also the choice of showing images or not showing images. Um, and partly I was struck by it, and maybe this had to do with some of the things that I was talking about in my talk, and we haven't really dealt with so much, about the fact that there always seems to be a level of mimesis or fascination or even a very ambiguous identification that's almost always um, inevitable when discussing about uh, uh, issues around uh, violence. And that was part of the reason why I was... Um, Thing, I, I was struck and kind of naively struck when I was reading some of this material about the Algerian war, about the fact that you have mm. the same people engaging in what would be to me like totally principled, you know, humanist, anti-colonial forms of solidarity, but also being, you know, uh, fascinated, in, <laughs> you know, with, uh, uh, you know, literary and other accounts of violence. So I guess that, that kind of question is one that, especially because we are in a, artistic stroke, intellectual stroke, cultural kind of space, uh, and I've been in another conference on violence where that was also the issue. You know, how, what does it mean to constantly to want to talk about it? And um, you know, Vanessa brought it up uh, uh, as well in terms of not wanting to just simply repeat and uh, engage in a kind of imitation of violence or make all forms of uh, uh, subaltern life or, 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 or dominated life about the violence that people experience. So that's, I guess, it's more like a problem that I think maybe we haven't explored as much as we could, but it seemed to me to run across a lot of the different talks, so. The problems of reiterating violence yeah. by talking of about Of a kind violence, of mimesis so and fascination, yeah. and uh, that's one of the things I wanted to say. I think actually some of that fascination one should own and, mm. and, and should also recognize that it might have, like, uh, 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 potentially emancipatory uh, uh, effects, that it's not, one shouldn't necessarily just be uh, uh, a kind of, so to speak, Puritan about it, saying, okay, well, we, if we talk about it again, we obviously repeat it. It's not so straightforward. And that unease and equivocity and ambivalence, I think, is part of these discussions, and I think it's interesting in terms of people's very different intellectual agendas and places that they come from, just to 
maybe uh, think about that, but that's just. Thank you, Alberta. Okay. Nina Power, please. What got uh, you thinking? Uh, uh, no, everything. Um, nothing. Um, especially nothing. Um, yeah, no, I suppose one thing that, that we could push a bit more is maybe like the explanations for violence. You know, I think it's very important, you know, obviously, um, Klaus Tabor, like yesterday, was speaking about kind of causal theory of violence to do with perhaps with like misogyny in the body and this, this kind of thing. Uh, and obviously, we've had various forms of, you know, description of violence, uh, representation of violence, yeah, the question of the image and so on. And, uh, and in a sense, you know, yeah, the, the, the not wishing to disavow one's own violence, one's own feelings of aggression, psychoanalytically, philosophically, personally, uh, physically, uh, what, you know, the, the kind of enmeshment in violence, the way in which we're, you know, uh, complicit in violence constantly. Um, and I, I think, yeah, the question of exit is maybe one that's raised by the, the last paper in a certain sense. You know, the, 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 I mean, if the idea is that political theory, in a sense, uh, you know, is kind of, we can't escape from it in a certain way we're trapped, you know, and obviously and that it's a monologue that all political theory is proposing a particular idea of human nature and therefore of politics, um, you know, and I, and I think I mentioned Hobbes precisely because it was about giving an explanation for violence, you know, the three causes of violence are, you know, the seeking for glory, you know, self-defense and, and uh, the other one, I don't know, uh, you know, fe yeah, feelings of wanting to possess something that someone else has. Um, and then I suppose, yeah, I mean, obviously I was trying to propose the idea of like a dialogue. And, but this, I mean, is important because precisely it's at the moment where we disagree most violently, perhaps, with the people we disagree with the most. You know, the people that we have already foreclosed and, and said, no, we can't speak to them. We cannot talk to the fascists. We can't talk to the neo-Nazi. We must no platform this person. This person believes the wrong thing. You know, that, and to not recognize the violence of the position of weakness, you know, the violence of the person who says, oh, I can't hear this thing. I can't listen to this thing. You know, it would hurt me to do so. You know, this is a very difficult moment. And we are in that moment in general. We're in this, that moment in academia. We're in that moment in public life. Uh, you know, it's a very, very difficult question and, and if we have that openly if we say look where is the harm that really what what harm are people feeling it you know what can we discuss and and in a sense this puts me in a, in a position of defending a certain notion of of freedom of speech and freedom of association and uh, freedom of think of thought um, which in a sense is attempting perhaps illegitimately to occupy a kind of uh, non-political which is to say philosophical ground it's like a almost like a I don't know a sort of spinazist <laughs> position in a certain way, but to try to um, hold open, if you like, not just a space for disagreement, for it, but a space for the recognition of violence such that we can collectively uh, talk about it and, and define it even or get somewhere with, a, 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 you know, a better place with an explanation for, for what violence is and that we all share somehow. Is that the philosopher in the attic talking now or is it the activist talking too? Uh, well, my, my philosopher is in the garden talking to okay. her friend. Sorry. But um, the mad uncle is in the attic sharpening his knives. But of course I will walk with my uncle, for sure. He's cool. <laughs> Vanessa Thompson. Yeah, I think... Um, I think what, what state with me... What's, what state with me also um, in terms of now the affect in this room and just in reference also with the um, regarding the, the last uh, presentation and the discussion around it is, yeah, again, part of the question of decolonial solidarity and on, on what kind of levels um, it, it fails within the process of trying to practice it and, and how it is rather a question of failing better. <laughs> um, not just to make it comfortable, but like rigorously, right? And, and how is, is, is decolonial solidarity in, I mean, when we talk about the space here in which we discuss violence um, and simultaneously violently erasing um, so many modalities of violence. And, and what does that tell us about how we are inflicted in violence um, on various levels in terms of different positionings, but also what, what, how, how does the process of, of decolon, deco, 
yeah, decolonial de solidarity is actually one that needs to confront the question of what is made visible and what is violently erased at the same time. And how do we then come also to a form of, of, of politics that is, that is rigid as, as, a, as a form of tough love? Like knowing you will fail, but trying to fail better. So I think it's, because I'm, I, I am like, what, what stays with me is really like, where was violence produced through images, the narratives? Where was, it not produced, but thereby also violently erased something. Um, so, knowing that there's no outside of violence. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Daniel, we have a big choice of microphones. <laughs> Seize it. Uh, yeah, uh, so the question was what got me thinking, and yes. I think it's very easy to say for me because it, it's just watching the news, and um, the reason for me to write this talk was really to un the attempt to understand this, what I was talking about, the uh, criminalization of the sea rescue. And I think this fact, this process, criminalizing sea rescue, um, is like so, out so outrageous for me. Like not only having the state not rescuing people in distress, not only having the state simply letting people drown, but actually the state hindering people who want to help others, right? And I mean, the whole, the, the deep outrageousness of this process to understand, first of all, how this could happen, how this could develop, and also try to correct the fact that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I work in philosophy, in academic philosophy, and uh, even in practical political philosophy, and I think the, mor the moral Obscene, obscenity of this fact has not really been addressed, I think, even by people who are interested in morality and, and so on. So I think then what you do if you want to understand what's going on is you try to give a narrative, a social analysis, how, the, how this could happen, what, what logics or political rationalities contributed to you know, this situation. Um, and then, but also, and I think uh, this is what, where it led me, where, where my analysis led me was um, that it leads you not into easy solutions, but into ethical dilemmas or ethical apurias. And I think um, this is actually, interestingly, very similar to what all three of you already uh, raised, the question of, first of all, like, uh, what does it mean to give testimony? What does it mean to, um, uh, to report cases of violence without reproducing it? without being part of uh, the spectacle. You know, the spectacle of black suffering is, is something that's very much present in, in talking about what's going on in the Mediterranean, that the, the images you see are really, I think, yeah, I mean, you, you could just say, well, we have to report what's going on, but I mean, you, you do reproduce a certain form of um, uh, pictorial <laughs> violence. And, um, so how can we, we how can we talk about these things without without reproducing? Is this one, and the other one is really the question of solidarity that that you already mentioned. That because also very present in this whole debate about sea rescue is uh, images of white saviors, and even in the German media, I think the narrative very often when you discuss cases like the Sea Watch or, or these ships, you discuss the biographies or the motives of white people. Who, um, who you know, uh, um, go on the, the ship to 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 rescue people and so on? And how is it possible? How is it possible to break out of this active, passive logic where you know you have one savior and one uh, person being saved and so on? And how is it possible to build uh, a solidarity that um, does not reproduce that? And I think I haven't come up with solutions for either of these two problems. But it's interesting that thinking does not lead you to solutions, but sometimes thinking leads you to dilemmas or to, to problems. And um, yeah, and I think that's also what happened in the, with the last talk, that you know, sometimes it's just, there's just no easy way out. And, and, and then maybe the, the right thing or the philosophical thing to do is to just <laughs> stay, um, stay in the wake and stay, uh, uh, try to understand these dilemmas that we, that we are facing. To face them, yes. Now, Klaus Tevelite, we know what made you angry by now, but I was asking you more about uh, what struck you as particularly um, inspiring or um, interesting in those two days you've attended the conference with us. Yes, interesting. It's always uh, to meet uh, people and listen to them who are working in a similar direction as oneself is doing. 
and uh, okay, what I what I learned from Mediterranean Algerian war and Mexican border and uh, Guatemala and uh, policing uh, racist. It's all over the world in a way uh, going on. So I I can feel part of that and uh, and. and for me especially, and uh, I take the opportunity when I got this invitation by uh, Susanne Pfeffer and uh, to stress this point, what I uh, to tried to do yesterday again, and when realizing this, this point of, uh, of anti-femininity in the center of the American alt-right, these people, and uh, it, I was astonished about that. I had thought that could have been historically um, Evaded or gone, with or in mm -hmm. and it's a it's a it's a it's a point completely put aside in, in German in public. And they don't write about the American um, the, uh, involuntary <laughs> celebratory man and so on. It's in private mm -hmm. was the same. Yes, mm -hmm. that um, this point of and why do they hate so much in gender? And gendering, they are gendered absolutely in every word they are doing, writing in the hierarchies and so on. So, and, uh, and uh, I tried to learn about it, uh, to hear about it, what other people say about it. And uh, one thing that um, appeared just the last um, days to me, that the point really is uh, when they are hating women and femininity like that, that it may be just the point of equality. They can't accept uh, not only women, children, and so on, other colors, other races as equal. They have to have this hierarchical world, and if that doesn't work, they go to the point of assassination and murder. Um, and uh, okay, there are things that are you know, haunting me in a way, in a, in not every day and every second, but in everything I'm working on. And uh, yes, so I was glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Sayak, you criticized um, the, what, what you said was the position of privilege. When talking about violence, are there other things that struck you as uh, evident or at the forefront of this discussion in the last two days that you probably didn't expect? Uh, well, actually, it's, thank you for the invitation. I think it's a really important uh, uh, yeah, really important meeting because we are sharing really different perspectives and positioning. And, and for me, it's a, uh, not only the content or the, the continent, the continent, but the content of the form and the and the sense of the discourse. And I I think it's uh, here right now in Germany, and there over there in the in the border, we are sharing troubles. Um, that it's uh, really, really important about migrations and other stuff. But also, for me, it, it is uh, really interesting that to to hear uh, the, the the whole person they just spoke here, um, because uh, sometimes uh, we can obviously we we can uh, learn everything and research everything. So I I just uh, realized that the way the the perception perception was changing historically about torture and politics and other stuff when you uh, uh, put it these images about the, the torture of uh, Bau, Bau, how is the, the, the last name Bupacha? Bupasha. Bupasha. and uh, and I was like uh, that was a really strong image, images right there and that, that time and that moment and it makes uh, a lot of sense for many people uh, and then that is Right now, we, we can see it like uh, art and kind of naive, but it's a really strong uh, image for that time. And, and the, the way the violence is just ascending and normalized in our context, it's like uh, showing off all the time violence, the, the way we just uh, making the interactions with uh, other people all the time that are maybe not here, but it's a kind of really violent, actually, the, the way we, we interact, uh, that I was interacting with uh, Geoffrey, uh, Geoffroy. Mm -hmm. Geoffroy uh, was a kind of a, a good example and performatic example about uh, the, how the violence works and in the both ways. Like, um, uh, like uh, we are thinking about violence, but we can, and even we are in the same, same team about the critic, 
criticizing the violence and whatever, but uh, also we have this hierarchy about uh, the power of the knowledge, the power of the being, and the power of uh, the coloniality of being, the coloniality of the uh, of the knowledge epistemologically, and all the all also the coloniality of the power and who have the power to be uh, questioned or not questioned. And uh, for me, it's really interesting about uh, how we can uh, not just make the mocking about this formula of about decolonization, like women and decolonization and blackness and how you are, uh, they, they uh, uh, he was like a mocking about it. It's not for mocking, it's about to put it really uh, complexity, the, the, the conversation of, about violence. And, and for me, it's really interesting that we are the making this effort to uh, rationalize violence, but also we are making other stuff with affects and emotions and other uh, other kind of uh, solidarities that just uh, unleash or, or making uh, so, so other kinds of communities of care and solidarity. And I just uh, want to say thank you to the persons in the public that just came to me and said, I want to say that, but I can't because I just don't. And I said, oh, okay. It's uh, not just uh, a way of perception of myself, it's a way of, of the, how the structure of the rationality is made it. So it's uh, really interesting and I think it's uh, a point for making a more further conversations and complex conversations about not just violence but what it means in the daily life violence. And, um, and I, I feel uh, really, I really appreciate uh, the, the whole, the, uh, effort that you you made for making this uh, symposium and uh, the kindness that the people who was uh, here and sharing and everything and it's, uh, and for me it's uh, like uh, if you are in Germany right now there is a lot of borders here too and that's why we have to keep in touch and talking about the uh, borders and uh, not just physically but also racial class and these things that I just uh, become sometimes like. Uh, empty concepts for uh, the academia, but we are not empty concepts. We are persons, we are flesh, we are uh, locations, countries, uh, per whatever, you know. It's not just about to reflect it, but to make uh, actions with this reflection. And uh, for you and for us, the, has the fa fascism is arising again, and in the colonialism never go out of our countries. We have this intersection really important. If you want to know, maybe it's a, it's a suggestion, but if you want to know uh, how the racial persons uh, go through all the time, and you don't know what it means, the coloniality in everyday life, you don't just thinking about fascism here and how it acts. And it's a different display of violence, but in the same, is the, the same rules about uh, making people violently uh, governant uh, with violence. And uh, it's, uh, I can explain it really good and really uh, clear because I'm speaking in English, so I'm making karaoke of myself. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's uh, really important uh, to have this discussion right now because we have to act against this kind of violence is all the time happening in the, the everyday life, like policing, uh, racialized, uh, or the representation of violence, but we, we, we are here for it because we want to change things. I think so, I think so. I'm here not just because I want to make a new book or uh, have a, a new um, performance. I am here because I want to make uh, this really violent, context and world uh, a different place, so, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So also, thank you to the organizers of this whole conference, I think. <laughs> yeah, time's running. I do have one more question, but I wonder, it's 4.30, should we open it up to the public already, or shall we? No, no, I know Runde, no? Okay, one more round. Let me go back to the beginning, so to speak. I know this is very general, again, but we're a big panel here. Um, let me just start on a very general term. In the introductory text to the symposium, uh, in the announcement, so to speak, um, the curators say, violence we are currently experienced, they speak of an increase of violence 
And that is not my point. My point is that they say it has led to a new public. I think we are part somehow of this new public, or at least of a public, uh, to discuss that increase of permeating violence. I know it is not specifically, it's not ge geographically specified, it's not racially or socially specified, it's not gendered, it's, that's what I mean with the general term. But do you think actually those discourses we are sort of making or doing in those two days actually do lead to new forms of public and can you identify those new forms of public that uh, strike you, say, in the last 10 years? We don't have to go one by one, just whoever thinks uh, would like to answer. Alberto, I know you're, uh, <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> you have to let it sink in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think since we are part of that public, it might be interesting just to spend a couple of minutes on the nature or on the on the nature of those publics. Have they are there new publics for those kind of questions? Actually, do you see an increase there? I mean, on the definition of the public. I mean, there's a very famous line from Robert Peel, who's the founder of the police in the UK, who says, like, the police are the public and the public are the police. You know, and there's a certain sense in which the public is deeply connected to the, the police in a certain way and to the polis. You know, this idea of the public, it's not a right or left-wing term, actually. It's a very, very manipulable term if we're t speaking about something like public opinion. Uh, you know, you can manipulate, you can create public opinion, you sure. can, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of too vague a question in a certain way, no offense, but um, it's very ge very journalistic sort of question. Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about kind of groups and collectives and communities and states, I mean, there is a, there is a sense in which you know, we might need to sort of have a kind of like etymological, historical, political precision in a certain way. I mean, certainly there's been lots of artworks that have tried to engage with the question of the, the public. And, you know, in, in uh, England and Wales, the, the law uh, that deals with public demonstrations is precisely the public order law, you know, and there's a serious question about the, the way in which the state actually uh, presupposes public disorder at all times. You know, that the, the, the state's fundamental assumption is that there is disorder and that people are unruly and the public is unruly and that when they get too out of order, like, so, for example, when they block the roads, and blocking the roads is about blocking the passage of the sovereign or about blocking the highway, basically. Ultimately, it's a very uh, old-fashioned question. It's like, can the king or queen get to where they want to go? You know, it's true. I mean, England is basically very feudal, but, you know, it's a good place to look, look at in, the, in this way. Um... You know, so, so basically you punish people, you punish the public in the name of another public, right? So the public of the public order law, right, is a, is a ghost, you know, it's made up. Like, so we were talking about, well, what is the state? Well, it's a bunch of people. Yeah, sure, let's not forget that. But it's very ossified. So, but public order is like, you, you get this image of the public. So the public that want peace and quiet, uh, the Queen's peace, as it's called, in fact. Um, so not only the peace for the Queen, but the peace as determined by the sovereign. Um, so... And then you, pu you punish actual individuals or groups in the name of this public, right? So there's a, there's a public of the, the actual public who's protesting, and then there's the public of the public order law in whose name they're being punished. So the state doesn't say, we're going to punish you directly. The sovereign doesn't say, right, I'm going to cut off your head or whatnot. Or so, I mean, it's a very complicated question. Yeah, <laughs> the public. Uh, well, I didn't want to talk about the police, really. Um, I just meant to... to to make it to make it more <laughs> concrete, I just thought: Are there like do you get a wider audience with your work? What you do? Is there more public awareness? Um, is there um, more mainstream coverage about uh, the work you do, about the subject you address? And I think that is implied in that uh, announcement, in that introductory text. And this is what I wanted to ask. Do you think there's more awareness for what you do, in other words? That's what I meant. Is there quasi a new kind of public or a public that recognizes or acknowledges more um, about the subjects we've talked about in the last two days? That was the pretty simple question I wanted to All ask right. and not address yes. the idea of the public <laughs> in philosophical <laughs> terms. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. Um, it's maybe important here to think of the public more in an intersectional sense and who can appear in the public and what kind of, of course, the issue of racial profiling, for example, if I now sure. yeah, refer to what I uh, was, what my paper was on, then there is 
a discussion of it, but at the same time it's disqualified. So it's also the question like, what kind of public is engaging with the topic, in which kind of way, and, and who is then able to even appear in the public. So I think, because you said it's, it's maybe not just a question of, of uh, all these um, oppressed uh, social relations and social categories, I think it, it is. Because who can appear in the public and even become, is, is like, and can enter the realm of the public and, and be recognized <laughs> as um, a subject of the public, a political subject, differs um, very tremendously, right? And I think the other question is, when I talked about the notion of fugitivity, I'm really, I'm troubleshooting myself with this, but, I'm, but I, I am thinking if the notion of the public being visible in the public is is the question like in and like when I when I think about post-colonial movements, anti-racist movements, it, it was long time about like visibility, right? But now with with the differential logics of 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 um, diversity, inclusion, etc. I I really think how can we withdraw from from visibility? Not completely, but I think like the underground, the fugitive notion is also something we have to think about more and interrogate more in terms of uh, the question of the public. Um, and then the third point, briefly, I know you wanted to, but I, I, I feel the pressure. No, I don't feel the pressure. I want to respond to the question of Eurocentrism. Um, because I, I find it really um, important, of course, to raise it. And I, I try to, to refer to that in terms of, like, we're speaking about violence and what is the violence, for example, we erase. I mean, we all know that two ne nuclear powers are India and Pakistan <laughs> at the moment, like, and what's the situation with Kashmir, one of the, one of the militarized like, regions in this world. And, and for me, as a person who also looks at policing, criminalization, et cetera, that's, that's crucial. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's very, like, so we have to think about how to make maybe these symposiums more horizontal in a radical way, not, not via the logic of including certain perspectives and then saying, okay, we don't have to talk about this because this person presents this perspective and this person presents this perspective. Because I am for accounting lived experiences, but I also think, uh, referring here to Yayana Khan, like, how can we depart in terms of our politics from a place that is not only defined by our identities? Um, and that also in terms of challenging, challenging um, Eurocentrism, to not just make it an inclusive logic, because it's also not that easy to say, okay, now we're just going to invite a person who speaks then on the Kashmir conflict, um, because at the same time, very often in this discourse, then local critiques are, for example, disqualified, right? Or neglected, invisibilized. So it's a very, um, yeah, very slippery slope. Yeah, that does work though. I would like to come back and for a moment to this point of policing again, which went through my head, yes, the last hours. And <laughs> what you described, yeah, absolutely clear and evident <coughs> racial profiling and so on. I realize it when going from Freiburg, where we are living, often to Switzerland, and the border police and coming through the train, uh, the custom people coming, whom are they controlling? Only people who are looking foreign. And uh, everybody who sits there, show the passport, open your bags and so on. Um, me is not uh, controlled for years now. Um, 20, no, 50 years ago, 40 years ago in the 70s when we crossed the border, to France, we were controlled as long-haired people all the time because of drugs, cigarettes, alcoholics, weapons, possibly in the car. Um, that point is over. But this policing, and uh, I want to add that to that what you told, is uh, is far more and uh, uh, the case for nearly everyone, possibly at every place. Um, 
some years ago and I've been teaching and my wife and me have been in Charlottesville for a term for four months and one of our uh, white friends there told us he was taken two times out of his car by police with gun at his head. He had done nothing and um, he was still living so he came out of the situation. But he said that can happen to you all the time. Not only uh, black people we know are more shot in the US than white ones, but them too. 70% uh, in the jails are black, are colored in a way, and uh, not white people. Uh, but uh, he said um, the police uh, is half half. Half of them are criminals or fascists. The other one, other half maybe uh, is okay. It's good luck if you meet this one or that one. And uh, so this part of, uh, that means uh, it can uh, happen to you every time, every moment, if you get to one of those half of criminals, he called the US police. Don't know how the percentage is here. We have G20 and things like that. There are criminal people on the side of the demonstrators and criminal people on the police side, obviously. And uh, Hamburg uh, Bürgermeister and so on, no, the police was okay. They was right there. They get this shelter for everything, what they are doing until now. And uh, I really don't uh, know how to get, uh, how to lower this or to uh, lower this uh, possibility of police uh, and violence. Now, always have in mind the ending of the uh, Chandler uh, novel, the big sleep, uh, where the last sentence are about the persons of the n novel. I never met any of them again, except for the police. No way has invented yet to get rid of them. Can I? Please, Ayak, and then we we'll probably open it to the public, I would say. Okay. okay. Uh, I just and want to uh, make, I, I don't know if it's a, there is a new public, but it's a, I think it's an intergenerational publics, and that is really important for me because the, the voices we are sharing here are uh, from different generations, but also the people who is coming to share with us and, and uh, listen us, but also share some, some stuff with us are younger. So for me, it's really important to open the conversation and the public uh, and the new publics, I don't know if it is new, but that the intergenerational stuff is really important because of the People who are before us, uh, they have uh, this memory of about all the time, but the, the other time, but the, the, the world was a comprehensive, uh, was, was different, shaped differently. And he, you know, it's like a passing information through the generations. It's really important to maintain uh, the memory, construct the, this uh, relation, but not only rational relation, but it's a body relation and uh, emotional relation and resistant relation and also exchange uh, strategies of resistance from their generations to the other gen our generation and the younger generation have their own uh, struggles and also own uh, strategies and I think we have to learn a lot of the young people a lot that from kids to 20s or the teenagers right now because they are making this exactly a uh, good reading of the world and the context because they are just born in this context, you know, and, and, and it changed a lot for many of us uh, um, born in the 80s. And then uh, I just saw uh, yesterday told about, uh, I really have this really clear memory about when the Berlin walls just fall. And, and it was really interesting for me as a kid that have the perception that everything can change in a day. You know, it was like a, something that's really, really symbolic, but also material. Mm. And it changed a lot of my perception. And that, that it was a historical change, but also gave me the, the possibility to know that the history matters and we construct it all the time. So for me, the, the idea of the new public is more like the public is there we have to occupy it with this intergenerational conversation for make some resistant strategies and make new conceptualizations of violence because uh, the actualization of the violence is really fast. So for me, it's really important to just think with the classics like 
in philosophy, but also with new forms of thinking violence this from art, from activism, from everyday life. So thank you very much for this, this questioning. Yeah. Thank you.